I forgot my paperwork too. But, uh, so Am I off the hook? Can you give me a minute? I mean, I got it all here, but you know what? Let's just we'll just we can wing it. We can go. I told Lorna this is gonna be a little different today, guys. So, uh, all right. So announcements. We had a successful pie day. We raised two hundred six dollars. So that was good. Um, I am still smelling whipped cream in my nose. Um, so I, 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 I scrubbed and scrubbed when I got home. But, Is that uh, a boost or a handicap? Oh, I think it's a handicap because I'm not a big whipped cream fan. Nobody knows this, oh. but I hate whipped cream. Really? I, no, that, that, oh. so, so, and I got lots of uh, intake of it today. So, But it was well worth it. Uh, like I said, $206 for recharge. So thank you guys for coming and, and being part of that. Uh, enjoyed it. Uh, this week, uh, Conscious Conversation Thursday, uh, political polarization is what we're going to talk about uh, Thursday. And how do we engage with people you know, people of different views? How do we build a bridge and start to change and transform the landscape of political conversation? Uh, April 20th at 10 a.m. This is going to be a fun meeting. It's only going to be about half an hour, guys. So if you can make it, swing by. Bella McDaniel is an incoming freshman. She has a she has a a, a nonprofit that she works with, uh, bringing hope to uh, underrepresented students and things. And so she's actually got a huge like uh, this this summer. She's going to have this big um, uh, conference. She's already got partners with, and she wanted to get to meet some of our guys, some of our folks, so we can start hit the ground running next year and maybe join with her on some things. So 10 o'clock, I'll send an email out to you guys personally, uh, the people that come to worship regularly, and uh, because I think we'll have a, have a good conversation about it. Uh, April 22nd is our second to last worship service. Uh, if you believe that or not, it's like holy smokes. Uh, and then, I don't have it on here, but April 24th is Amanda and I's 25th wedding anniversary, so I'm very excited about that. Uh, and then the 25th, Seven till probably eight fifteen or so, we are going to have the convocation in Dahl Chapel with uh, the interfaith dialogue. Uh, Lena is going to introduce me uh, for the talk, and then I've got a few other students that I'm going to call. Uh, and if you would be a part, if you want to be a part of it, let me know because we will. Uh, uh, we're going to need some ushers. JC, you already agreed, right? That, uh, and so if we can get a couple ushers uh, to hand out programs. And, and such. So that's the announcements. Anything else, guys? I think we got what is it? Scott's Day is next Tuesday. Is that right? April 23rd. Uh, oh, Scott's Day of Giving this Thursday. I'm not really sure what I'm doing, but I'm in, in the Trubeck Amphitheater for three hours or two and a half hours or something. So come by and see me. That, that, uh, that uh, I, like I said, I have no clue. I'm just going to listen to whatever Meredith tells me. That, uh, so there's our announcements. Okay, today we're going to talk about witnessing and being a witness. And this is Dorothy Day, not the actress, that uh, the Catholic worker. She she came up. She published the Catholic Worker. She is an absolute. In fact, she's not a saint, but she's now actually being looked at as uh, going through the process of of, of that. Um, I don't think she will get it, but um, you know she's big. But uh, she's a fabulous witness to, to, the, to the gospel. And she had this quote, and I loved it. We have all known the long loneliness, and we have learned that the only solution is love, and that love comes with community. Being part of community is the way to go in if we're going to live the gospel out in our lives. Oops. Bear with me, I'm on a new computer, too. There we go. All right, call to worship, guys. Let's join together. When we are confused, Lord, Lord give us peace. When we are afraid, Lord, Lord give us peace. When we are lost in grief, Lord, Lord give us peace. O oh God, God, meet us in this room and grant us peace. All right, Lena, since my paperwork's there, I'll do this for you. Ta da. Ta <laughs> So guys, we'll do this a little different tonight. What's going on in the world that we need to lift up in prayer? 
Anything? Well, the, the uh, Iran uh, firing on Israel and the worry of further action. Retaliation. Yeah. Robert, did you say something? I just said, you know, just further conflicts in the Middle East, mm -hmm. uh, obviously. You know. Gaza, Green. Israel, Iran now. Um, yeah, all, all of that, right? What's happening in our country? Anything? Go to the concerns? The elections? I'm telling you. Yeah. <laughs> Keep that in your purse every day. But, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the election. Uh, the weather. This mm -hmm. is the time of year for extreme weather going through. We were just talking before, the, before we started that we just got alerts for possible severe storms tomorrow. So, um, and I know the office, I was in the office with Hope before we, we, we closed our, she left today and she was telling me that I think they're, we're under, gonna be under a tornado watch. Is that right, tomorrow? Um, not a warning yet, no, so. it's only a warning when they have one sighted, so yeah. they can't give us one of those for tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah there we go. That's, that's, so we got that, we got, um, we got harvest time, right? Uh, so the farmers, keep the farmers in, in, uh, in our prayer. We also have a large homeless population in our country. Let's keep them in our prayers uh, so they reach shelter. We also have one of the near dear things to my heart is recovery. And we need, with the fentanyl crisis that we're, we're under, let's, let's pray that somebody can find a way to bring that to an end. Um, also, keep in prayer what we're doing next week with Interfaith Dialogue. That, that people will learn to kind of listen and talk to each other. All right? What about on the campus? Anything, guys? Any prayers on the campus? How about for you guys finishing the semester strong? Do that. And the seniors graduating. And the seniors graduating. Uh, that, that there's Lorna's actually graduating in two weeks, too. Or no, next week. No, no, it's a, um, a week from this Saturday. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. So, yeah, week and a half. So. Uh, so, so we've got graduates. Lena's our graduate here, and Alejandro will graduate. Um, and so, keep keep our graduates in our prayers. Keep our keep the students in our prayers. Uh, we got a new president coming, so let's 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 keep the community in our prayers as we as we do that. Any others joys and concerns today? All right, let's pray. Glorious and loving God, thank you for this day and this time. We thank you for always watching over us and giving us a chance to witness to your good news. Empower us today to truly listen for the Spirit's voice and call in our lives. And let us recklessly go into each day willing to radically love one another. Willing to show compassion to one another. Willing to grow with one another. Help us to truly become conversationalists. To communicate and to connect with our brothers and sisters. We ask that you be with all of those who are being impacted by the Middle East conflicts. Help them to find safety. Help them to find peace of mind. Allow our world leaders the strength and the wisdom to bring an end to all violence. We lift up those who are in the process of this election teach us to no longer be satisfied with sound bites. Let us truly debate issues in a way that's constructive for our country and for all people. Teach us to be respectful to one another in our disagreements and to learn from one another. Let us grow in our openness to learning from other faiths and recognizing and respecting other beliefs so that we may build bridges rather than divides. We lift up our seniors as we prepare for this last leg of, of this semester. Let us embark on this journey with one another in a way that lifts each other up. Let us be kind and grace-filled when we walk this campus and when we enjoy embark on conversations, let us be respectful let us grow with each other. We ask that you be with our new president coming in, as well as President Wyatt going out. Help them in the transitional phase and let this community flourish and go forth 
being a beacon of light and hope out into our community and the greater world. We ask that you be with all of our brothers and sisters who are homeless and seeking shelter. Help them to find their way, Lord, to know that you're with them each and every step of the way. And Lord, we lift up all of that which remains too private to share in those precious words you've taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. text today comes from Luke 24, 36-40. Actually, it goes to 48, sorry, but this is the first slide. Uh, while they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood up to them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled, they were terrified, and thought that they were seeing a ghost. And he said to them, Why are you frightened? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands, look at my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. So while in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wandering, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of boiled fish. He took it and he ate it in their presence. And they said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. So we're going to see a video on Dorothy Day. In many ways, Dorothy Day was a typical grandmother. I see my grandmother as someone who was very ordinary, but also very extraordinary. I mean, I understood that she was different. Different because Dorothy Day was so often on the front lines, protesting war and nuclear buildup, creating houses of hospitality for the hungry and homeless, and earning her place on the FBI watch list as a dangerous American. Yeah, Dorothy Day is a big troublemaker. As a young journalist, Dorothy Day campaigned for those in need. Her work keeps putting her front and center in the social movements of the time. She wrote about workers' rights, child labor. She was attracted to communism, believing it was a way to improve people's lives, all part of a chapter in her own life that would leave its scars. But with the birth of her daughter, Dorothy Day turned from communism and converted to the Catholic faith. There, she discovered a path that for nearly a half century led her to become one of the greatest champions for the poor America has ever known. She thought if communism was radical, why shouldn't Christianity be radical? This is radical. My grandmother always said that she never meant to start houses of hospitality. She never meant to open up soup lines. But what happens when you start writing about these things, people show up at the door. She wanted the people to exercise their own sense of personal responsibility. You see something that needs to be done, you do it. But accepting the biblical challenge to be peacemakers also compelled her to become a pacifist without compromise to use her Catholic worker movement and the newspaper she founded to resist America's intervention in any war. Many believed her behavior was un-American. She did describe herself as an anarchist. There's an anarchist dimension to her Christian witness. Some of the most profound and most rewarding demonstrations that culminated in arrests were with the Catholic worker community. I think of Dorothy Day as a firecracker that never goes out. Now this grandmother, and anarchist, may well be declared a saint. 
We'd love to see Dorothy made a saint. For both American middle class people and for Catholics, they recognized that something extraordinary was going on. They weren't quite sure what to do with it. She annoyed people because she challenged them. She was, don't call me a saint. I don't want to be written off that easily. I think if you take the Lord's words, you'll find they're pretty rigorous. The Sermon on the Mount may be read with great enjoyment, but when it comes to practicing it, it really is a, an examination of conscience to see how far we go. So Lorna and I are going to have a conversation like we did uh, last week with Kelly, and uh, and we're going to discuss the witnessing fact. But and Lorna's got the hiccups right now, guys. No, so they they stop. Oh well, then there, see, it's a it's a it's a blessing. It is. <laughs> that, 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 uh, uh, so uh, you know the fun thing about having a conversation with someone that you enjoy with with especially from a theological standpoint, right? Is you get to see just like last week, you guys got to see Kelly come to Kelly Kelly came at from one way, I come at it from another way. Lauren and I are similar, right? We have very similar uh, theological foundations, uh, but we're going to get to see how we both look at things and see things. So, uh, so Lauren, I'll let you start. When you read this text, what comes to mind? When I read this text, what comes to mind in general? Sure. Um, <laughs> well, you know, it's not the only text that talks about Christ coming in their presence, um, but, um, you know, so you like to look at those differences, and we get so focused in this particular one on, you know, Christ wanting them to go out and spread the, the good news um, that I think we miss one of the, my favorite parts of this, which is where um, we're, it says that Jesus opened their minds to the scriptures. And we may not have Jesus standing right here right now, but we do have the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God is with us at all times. And, and that is how we can understand the scriptures and have them open to our minds. Um, and truly be able to ask the Spirit, how, how does this that happened so long ago how does that really have bearing on my life? What, what should it mean for me being a witness? You know, because really being a witness encompasses every part of our lives. Not just sharing the good news with someone, you know, um, like this is the good news. This is what Jesus Christ does for me. Okay, great. But there's so much more to being a witness than verbally sharing. And, and she, she picked out my favorite verse in this text, and it's one of my favorite verses in the Bible, and I actually stop it, he opened their minds, right? He opened their minds, because especially in the world we live in today, we have such a narrow perspective of faith and who God is, we, we miss it. Desmond Tutu has a wonderful saying, he, he, says, he says that when you look at other faiths, what we should understand is that all their faiths give us this grand opportunity to see the immensity of God. The immensity of God. But too often, somebody reads that text and they'd say, well, the only way you know God is through Jesus. See? And that's narrow-mindedness. That's not open-mindedness. There's a story about the Buddha that, that I just love, and I compare it with this text because I think it ties into how do we become witnesses? The Buddha becomes enlightened, and he's walking a path, and a gentleman walks by, and the Buddha's just glowing, right? He's got, he's got, he just has this look about him, you know, if you ever walk past somebody, and they're like, he's got it, right? Or she's got it, right? And that was the way, the way I envisioned this, and so the Buddha's walking by, and the guy looks at the Buddha, and he goes by him, and he stops, and he says, excuse me, excuse me, he says, are you God, or a divine being? And the Buddha gently looks at him and says, no, I'm not. And so the, the guy looks at him again and says, well, you, are you a, some kind of sorcerer or a witch of some kind or, or what have you? And the Buddha looks at him gently and says, 
no, I'm not. And then the guy looks and says one more time, he says, okay, so are you just a man? And the Buddha looks at him and says, no, I'm not. And so the guy gets frustrated and he throws his hands up in the air and he's like, well, then what the heck are you? Because I have no idea. And the Buddha looks at him and he says, I am awake. I am awake. When Jesus opened the minds of the disciples, he was awakening them. And I love how Lorna tied it because not only was Jesus opening the minds of the disciples, he's opening our minds today to be awake. And what does that mean? Well, the reason you guys got Dorothy Day today was because I think Dorothy Day is one of the greatest 20th century examples of being a witness to being awake. Why? And it stems partially from her quote there about the Sermon on the Mount. We have to understand that being a witness to God, to Jesus, to, to, to the good news as a whole is a radical thing. It is radically compassionate. It is radically grace-filled. It is radically anti-violence. And until we are awakened, it's easy to fall into us molding God rather than God molding us. Does that make sense? So that's kind of my first instinct, too. Well, and we're also likely to fall into this sense of powerlessness. We see something happening, but we feel like there's nothing I can do to make a difference. Well, if you can make a difference, even for a moment for one person, then, then you can make a difference. You know, and it's not, it's not about solving all the world's problems, but you can be the difference for someone in that moment in their lives. And you know, never let anyone or even yourself take that away from you, that, that you are called to, to be that difference and be able to do for others what, what's within your power to do. So you used a great word, called. How many people in here feel like they're called to do something? <laughs> that's exactly right every one of you is called to do something every one of you when I was your age and actually when I was a little older because I was an old man when I went to college and I sat in these chairs I thought called was only for religious people right that, that's, that's the only place that that, uh, that term meant anything the reality is that God calls all of us to do things and to do the the, the little steps, you know, Pope, Fra uh, Pope Francis, St. Francis had a saying that I, I love dearly, and I pray to model it, and I pray that all of us model it daily. It, Francis told the brothers, the friars, he said, always <clears throat> preach the gospel. Use words when necessary, meaning our actions have got to preach the gospel. And each and every one of you is called to be that good news. And that good news, is, as Dorothy Day says, is means living into the world the lessons that you're taught through the life and teachings of Christ and other faiths, right? I mean, um, you guys are getting my morning emails, right? Don't blow them off. <laughs> but I, I intentionally pick different people every day for the morning statement that I'm using, right? Today was Malcolm X, right? Um, how, many have, how many have heard at one time or another that Malcolm X was the bad guy, Martin Luther King was the good guy, right? That was the normal trend, right? Did you, really, did, you under, did you know that Malcolm X, towards the end of his life, and what essentially probably got him killed was he was leaning towards King, towards nonviolence. He, he was seeing the manipulation of, of of the nation of Islam at that time from the higher ups, and he was starting to turn that his voice, and so, but that never gets talked about, right? Because we want to set up the black, the, the black and white good and bad guy, right? But Malcolm X, that quote I use today is actually one of my favorite quotes about loving. That's the only way we're going to transform this world is if we truly begin to love one another as deeply and as profoundly as we can. Earl, later this week, you're going to get a text from uh, an email from Rumi. Who knows who Rumi is? He's, a, he's an Islamic uh, monastic scholar. 
Um, and don't ask me to pronounce the actual title because I can't, but it's in your email. <laughs> It'll be in your email, right? Um, but Rumi is this fascinating figure, and he was a wonderful poet. And he opened, he's opened my eyes through his poetry. And guys, let me tell you something, okay? I hate poetry. I, I couldn't stand it. And then I started reading his stuff. And then I, so that got me to read some other stuff. And guess what? Some of these guys know what they're talking about in this poetry. And it's amazing, right? And I no longer could say, because I was in that black and white mode, right? So, but now I learn from poets. And they're amazing gifts to this world. You see, this is the way we have to do. We have to grow in our, in our witness. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> but these are, the, these are the fun times, right? So you guys, you know, what's, what, what are ways that, there's the other thing is, you guys hear it from me all the time, right? Is you guys are to make the voice, or to be the voice of the next generation of the future. Things are not going to change if we continue to do the status quo, and you guys are amazing gifts to this world that have, have this ability to be that voice. So how do you do that? How do you, how do you guys witness? What, when you guys hear the word witness, what, do you, what comes to mind? Witnessing an event is what they mm -hmm. You know, yeah. every time somebody whips out their cell phone and starts recording something that's going on, they're being a witness. They are bringing in this image or these, this video, and then they're sending it out, okay? Because they don't normally just take it and then not show it to anybody, right? right? Um, and that's, that's a witness, not necessarily a positive one all the time, but I mean, it, it's a witness. And... I mean, so even something as simple as that, that, that's part of witnessing, just letting people know what's going on, or in this case, you know, with the biblical witness, letting people know what's wrong with the world and how we should be different in how we're treating others. And, and too often, I'll tell you, when I was younger uh, in the ministry, you know, when I heard the wit word witness, the reason I asked you guys that was because when I first heard the word witness, when I was in seminary, I would have ran the other way because I thought, oh crap, there's another fundamentalist coming at me, right? And and that's why these words have to be reclaimed too, you know. Yeah. Well, and I'm I'm in my final semester, as we yeah. talked about, and I had one class that they saved for final semester, and I was not looking forward to this class. Okay, I thought I didn't like the teacher. <laughs> I still don't like the book he made me read that he wrote, um, but it was about evangelism, and, and that word left a nasty taste in my mouth, you know, because of fundamentalists and being pushy and the whole, you know, have you claimed Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Great, let's move on to the next. What, what about helping someone to grow, you know? Um, and so I, don't get me wrong, I, I mean, knowing Jesus Christ personally is a very important thing, but it's not a one and done thing, you know, it's, it's a lifelong process. And, and that brings up, I, Lena, you've heard me say this a bunch, uh, God is a we God, not an I God, right? And so when you put it in that perspective of, oh, I, I, here's, here's a question that drives me bonkers, is when somebody looks at me and says, well, when were you saved? Well, here's the deal. God loves you from the day you're born. So as far as that question goes, from the day you were born, God is with you. But you have a responsibility, and it's called, Dietrich Bonhoeffer calls it costly grace, to understand that we are called to walk with one another in that same way of teaching the good news, of being able to profoundly touch the world, guys and show compassion to each other in, in that. And that does not mean you're going to agree on everything, because you're not. But it means, what do we learn in our Thursday night conversations? Be respectful, right, to everybody, and, and listen. Disagree with respect and civility, because when you're witnessing to God, 
God speaks to Lorna differently than me, even though we're both seminarians, we both have a very similar track as far as who may have taught us or what have you, right? But God speaks to me very differently, right? There are pastors that would not at all feel comfortable with the things that I say, right? And I wouldn't be comfortable with the, the way they say it sometimes, right? It doesn't mean that anybody's better than anybody. It means that we're talk, we, we feel God's presence in different ways. Each of you feels God's presence in different ways. That's why, that's why we want these communication services, right? Because God speaks to us all in different ways. And, that's, and, and, and we go back to the text, God opens our minds in different ways. And it's, you should never discount what somebody else has to say because they've lived a different life than you have. And maybe they have something to share that just isn't part of your personal experience. Um, as a female pastor, I'm going to encounter a lot of people um, who, especially other clergy, um, who are not going to listen to a thing I say just because it's coming from a woman. You know, and I'm not less for that. Their experience is less because they don't listen. So. And it, it's really hard because I think that's a great point for when we, when we witness is you can learn something from the most least likely place. You know, I always, I always try to tell you guys that, that every day I learn something new from you guys, right? I mean, I hear something and it's like, oh, wow, that's a neat perspective, right? Or I, or I have a conversation with one of you and, and I just love it, right? because you're teaching me something from your perspective. And that's, that's what you have to understand is the beauty of being a witness to the good news. It's living into a reality that says you're worthy, but it also says you're worthy. And everybody is in that sense. So last week, Kelly brought a, put a great question out there about the power of God, which everybody kind of soaked that up for a little bit, right? So now you've had a week to think about it. So now, if, if God is, 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 as Kelly said, all loving but not all powerful, why do we have to be the witnesses? Why do you think it's important for us to become that person that shares God's grace or love into the world? Why is that important? Well, to make a difference in other people's lives and a positive difference, that's the only way positivity is known by doing. Absolutely, right? See, and my viewpoint isn't that God is limited, but that God limits God's self. Um, because God created us in God's image, right? Male and female, God created us. And that doesn't mean we're just like God, all-powerful, etc., but it gives us some freedoms of choice. And our choices are not always going to have good outcomes. But to intervene in things would be to take away the choice, which is a major part of having created us the way that God did. And so, in essence, in my mind, God has tied God's own pants. I'm trying not to say he or him, because <laughs> in different groups that yeah, gets, upsets that. people. You, you know, you just hear male yeah, talk so yeah. much about God. But that's why you're hearing me say God so much. Um, but now I lost my track of what I was saying. <laughs> anyway, um, we, are, we are created in God's image. And we have been empowered. Empowered so that we can reach out to others. Okay? Not empowered so that we can get our biggest piece of the pie. Um, because... God gave us all the pie in the world. I mean, this world is ours. Not mine, but all of creations. You know, um, I kind of think the Native Americans uh, or indigenous peoples had a really a right way of thinking about that. That land and, and all that is not something you own. It's something that is there to be used and to be cared for. Well, and, and I think I think that goes to saying that co-creator image that Kelly brought in last week too, right? Is is being co-creator, mm -hmm. um, and and I love I love that imagery because what what that does and it tells us is that we are called 
all of us to build, to build upon things, to build and to care about things, right? That the you audience, know, okay, when I watch something or see something, I can't help but look, look at it through a theological lens, right? So just, I'm, I'm watching this new show on TV called Leverage Redemption. I don't know if anybody's watched it, but it's about four crooks that, that do good things, right? They go on and they do these jobs and they actually uh, help people, right? And, and, uh, and they were having a conversation that was really powerful in one of the episodes that I watched. And the conversation was one of, one of them said, we have to do more, we have to do more, we have to do more because we're not doing enough to save the planet, you know, in this way. And the other, other one looked at her and said, said, we can only do a little at a time but when we look back at it, it'll be a lot. And it's that ripple effect. And so the way I think God works with each of us is that God throws that rock in that pond and it just ripples out. And we're all the ripples. And we have to, we have to ripple out in order to connect and to build something. Because that's the thing that, you know, I want to ask you, when you watch the news or, or the election, is, is a good place to look at. Do you think that the people that the, the, the thing that's selling is a God of limitation or a God of abundance? What do you see in the news media and, and such? Do you understand what I'm saying? Abundance, I think. Huh? Abundance, I think. Yeah. In the news or when 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 somebody says to you, all the all these people are bad that are coming across the is that an abundance or a limitation? Limitation, right? And they're taking our jobs. And, and they're, they're taking our jobs, this, right? And everything else. I'm having to support them yeah. without my consent yeah. and yeah. all those kinds of things. So, so what that is, is a tactic to scare you into believing things. And let me tell you, you guys taught me a great thing by having me do that conversation on immigration, right? So I've been reading all this stuff. And let me, I'm here to tell you that 85% of what is being spouted is not fully true, right? And, and, and why is that? And part of it is because when we sell limitation, we sell fear. And when we sell fear, we, sell, we make boats in a lot of ways. But God tells us always there's enough. There's enough for all. There's enough for all if we are willing to use it, our resources, properly. If we're going to be the stewards of creation that we're called to be. And that's a hard concept to sell in a world that has for-profit prisons that only make money by what? How does, how does a, a, a private prison make money? By filling it up, right? Yeah. By filling that place up. So what do you have to do to fill it up? You gotta arrest people. These are the things. So when we when we talk about that and we talk about the God of abundance, that's the witness that we need you guys, you guys to, to walk into right now is, is that image of being able to be the people God calls you to be and being able to stand up and be strong enough to recognize that we don't have all the answers. None of us have all the answers, but what we do have is this gift that God gives us and it's the spirit, the advocate that's going to walk with us this up and help us to become the witnesses we're called to be. So that's the challenge for us. And that's the call, I think. But well, and on what you said earlier about the ripple effect mm -hmm. of our actions, it seems small at the time, right? Um, if you, if, um, and you were talking about our stewardship and such, which is like an Old Testament concept, right? From, from Genesis, we were charged to be stewards of the planet, right? Um, so if you stick with the Old Testament even, which is a very valid testament and a lot of people just kind of ignore it be in favor of the new, I like to look at the new and look at the old through the lens of the new and you learn so much about God that way. But my point is um, that, uh, well, I'll get that point back in just a second. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I'm a little distracted here. Um, so this this moving forward, uh, you know, this ripple out effect of, of your actions, I think is spoken of in the Old Testament when it talks about those who do evil, um, there's punishment to the third and fourth generation. 
but those who walk in the ways of the Lord or of God, um, that they are blessed to the thousandth generation. And I think this is that ripple out effect when you're when you're doing evil, those types of things end up uh, having their own effects. Um, and because God's given us free will, God can't just cut it off, you know, and say this is it, you know. Um, not if we're going to have remain having that free will. And yet, when we're following God, that's something where God can just pour out those blessings. And that I mean. A, blessings in abundance, right? Um, and so there's so much in the entire Bible that is uh, supportive of this, and you just don't get to hear it very often. So guys, we took you along yesterday. So do you guys have any questions you want to ask? Or not yesterday, last week. <laughs> Sorry, last week. Do you have, have any questions about this? Or do you have any statements or any, any comments you guys want to make towards about this text, about the topic, anything? That is absolutely fabulous. I'm going to steal that, by the way. And I think I saw that, I think, from Epictetus, or I think it was Epictetus. Yep. Yep. That, that, uh, that's, because that narrows your mind, right? Mm -hmm. As soon as you think you know it, right? You can. Then you're not yeah. open. Yep. But Thomas Merton used to say, I love Thomas Merton. He's next week, by the way. <laughs> so uh, Thomas Merton used to say, do not ever memorize the Bible. Don't memorize any scripture whatsoever. Why? Because when you memorize it, you quit learning. If you come at it every time like it's the first time you've seen it, you're going to be open and receptive to it. It's one of the things I absolutely love. And it's probably the reason I blame, I blame him for, I'm not really a biblical scholar, I'm more of a systematic theologian. Um, so, uh, so I'll explain that some, some day to y'all. <laughs> I'm saying like yeah, if you think that like everything has been done in the world or that you can't do something new, like that's just a limiting factor to your mind. Like we have to look at the world through like a, a lens that like people from centuries ago were to create new ideas and new ways of thinking that can like change the world for the better. Like right? we really have to look at everything as if it were brand new. And uh, you're preaching one of these times. Okay. <laughs> That, 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 I'm, I'm grabbing you now, but that, 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 um, because it, that's dead on, right? It's one of the most beautiful things you'll ever read is Socrates and the Symposium. Have you guys read that yet? Well, I'm going to. So you, yep. Yeah, that, 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 uh, so I'm not going to spoil it, but it's all about that open-mindedness, right? Um, and and also Plato the Republic, right? I mean Plato the Republic, right? These people were brilliant, but they'll be the first to tell you. Maybe not in the words I'm using, but they didn't know everything, right? That's the beauty, truly, of a philosopher, is that you are constantly growing with it. You're constantly learning. That's that should be exactly where you are as a theologian as well. You know, lifelong. it's lifelong, absolutely. You know, I always laugh that that 19 years I spent at the pulpit in in a small rural church, or 18 and a half, not quite 19, uh, and. I was a different pastor in year 18 than I was in year 1, 5, 10, and probably 17, right? And I hope to be a different chaplain in year 1, hopefully I'll have another long career here, so, you know, um, because that's how we grow, that's how we learn, we ask questions, and, and if we disagree with something, we say, hey, why do you feel that way, and let's talk about it, and then maybe I'll understand that, and we'll help each other grow, and that's witnessing to the good news. Jesus never once said, when, when the lawyer went to Jesus and said, hey, who is my neighbor? Jesus said, the Asian down the block. Right? That was his answer. No, it wasn't. He said, let me tell you a story. And he tells him this beautiful story about a Levite, a priest, and a Samaritan. The Levite and the priest were the heroes. That audience would have thought, yes, there, there it is. They're going to save that, that broken down man. And they walk by. And then the Samaritan comes out of nowhere. By the way, the Jews hated the Samaritans. I mean, absolutely hated the Samaritans. And the Samaritan lived into who his neighbor was. That's because Jesus was teaching that culture a brand new lesson. They don't know everything. So as you guys go out, 
and as you start to finish your first, first year here, your last year here, <laughs> then I'm, um, as you come in to your first year here, and Matthew, you go into your last year at high school, right? As you go into your first ministry, right? And Robert, the transitions all of you are going through, right? I mean, we're all learning and we're all growing, but we all do it together. You see, that's the beauty of it. That's the witness of Jesus Christ. Jesus never once said, hey, you're in and you're out. He said, peace be with you to all of them. And he opened all of their minds. It's not part of them. He fed at the Last Supper Judas, just like he did everybody else. And he also said that what's impossible for man to do, those that can't be, you know, sound, well, who can be saved? Mm -hmm. You know, talking about it's harder for a rich man to make it into heaven than to, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And they're like, well, then who can be saved? And, and Jesus' reply is, well, what's impossible for man is not impossible for God. So God, never give up on anyone. Everyone is God's child. Every single person. And they all have value. And a lot of them have no idea the value that that's it. Everybody needs to hear they're worthy. And they are God's child. You guys have heard me use the image that Father Boyle uses. Think of this. God makes that grand circle of compassion. And now think of this. No one is ever outside of that circle. In God's world. That's the blessing. And that's the witness. Alright guys. Give Lorna a round of applause. Thank you. <laughs> this is why I love you guys, right? Yeah. So we're, we're, we still want a few minutes late. <laughs> so, uh, uh, guys, uh, I think the 29th of April is our last worship service. Do you guys want a pizza party for worship? Would that be okay? I think we're going to do pizza that night for everybody. Then uh, we'll have a laid back. Our worship service will be a communal communion service with pizza and soda. Absolutely. Everybody. I'll know at that point if I'm yeah, 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 yeah. You better come because we'll, we'll have that announcement made, right? So, guys, as we close today, remember this. We're going into our final weeks. You guys are overwhelmed, I'm sure, with everything. Lena and I were talking and she was pieing me today, by the way. Um, by the way, three of you pied me pretty good. So, <laughs> it was fantastic, you guys. I loved every minute of that. That was awesome. I, I'm not loving the, the smell of whipped cream still, but, but I loved the moment, and, and you guys were great. Uh, but the anxiety of next steps, transitions, you know, they get to you. But know you're not alone. Know you are with a community that cares and that's present. We may not have the answers, but we're going to walk with you. Because that's what Christ taught, teaches us to do. Christ will meet every one of us where we are. So we are called to meet everybody else where they are. Not where we want them to be, but where they are. So let us go in peace, knowing that our God is the God of abundance, and that all is possible. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I can find my water bottle. <laughs> I have a spare right here. I can give it to you.